at today's <clears throat> talk, I'm going to, in some ways, uh, build, for those who aren't familiar with the first book, some inroads to have you become familiar with the kind of work that I do. Um, for those who are, are much more familiar with the early scholarship um, that I've penned, you'll get a chance to see, you know, some kind of more conceptual areas that I'm moving in the direction of. And, you know, all of this is in the service of an, what I hope to be a, a bigger set of conversations that we can have about the synthetic treatments of segregation and particularly the centrality of violence in advancing American political culture um, to keep the frame and the nationalist uh, you know, boundaries just for the, for the most part. Um, so blood and soil, real estate and racism in modern American history. Now, I'd I like to, to start with you know, just a way of introducing uh, some principles or some ideas or some assumptions that we have about what we think we know about the relationship between segregation and American history and culture. Now, we think we know that Jim Crow segregation <clears throat> was imposed by whites onto black people and that blacks largely had no choice in the matter. And you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons why we come to the history of segregation with that assumption. You've seen, obviously, a number of still photos, black and white video, I mean, the, the kinds of oppressive regimes and violence that marked the Jim Crow period make it very easy to understand it almost flatly as a problem of imposition. We tend to think we know that segregation was too expensive to maintain, taking a very Typical example of, say, the Jim Crow rail car, you have to have both a white and a colored car. You think about a white and a colored bathroom. You think about the duplication of the Jim Crow system as itself creating a lot of expense in terms of overhead. You also think about negative press and publicity that afflicts areas like the southern United States, making it unappealing for folks to want to invest in the Jim Crow world. And that, too, becomes a kind of expense that makes it difficult to sustain Jim Crow segregation beyond the 1960s. We think we know that in that period of American history, the 1960s, that segregation ended through a combination of moral arguments and these unsustainable economic costs. And again, the hardwiring, even though many of us want to complicate the pantheon of activists who you know, mark Black History Month or you know, Martin Luther King Day and the like, we still have a way of believing that a certain kind of moral suasion was necessary for unmaking Jim Crow segregation. And that coupled with the financial burden of the institution also led then to its demise. Now, when we came to moments such as this in August, of 2017, when you had white supremacists on the campus of the University of Virginia, many of us were surprised by virtue of having this narrative of what we thought we know operating in the background. I actually remember you know, teaching my Jim Crow in America course when Trump won the election in 2016 and not being terribly surprised by the outcome in terms of having you know, some historical sense of reconstruction and its ending and you know, the generational debates that had to get worked out in order to get us from the 1860s to the 1960s. But for most folks, seeing this kind of iconography and imagery of overt white supremacy was very jarring. And it send, sent a message about you know, where we were in proximity to an earlier moment of direct performance of white supremacist politics. Similarly, we tend to get confused when we find what we consider to be strange bedfellows in the world of interracial politics. So when you have someone like Kanye West showing up at the White House and not really you know, having a sense of even the gravity of his own symbolic presence relative to authorizing someone like Donald Trump or you know, Jim Brown or someone like Steve Harvey who kind of unwittingly winds up in the lobby of the Trump you know, building. Um, in New York City, you know, these are things that tend to confuse us. And what I would, you know, submit for you all this, for your consideration this morning or this afternoon is that these, both in terms of the, you know, uh, Charlottesville event and in terms of Trump's own presence in the White House, but also as, you know, what I call here the landlord in chief, that these are really, you know, processes, politics, and, and imagery of American political life and culture that are steeped in the Jim Crow playbook, in the Jim Crow grammar, politically, so to speak. Um, and it's important to understand Trump as a real estate man. It's important to understand Kanye West as a capitalist, an entrepreneur, in order to understand why something like the summit at the White House is a very consistent happening in the longer history of American politics. <clears throat> 
in rethinking segregation, I want to basically, you know, submit three things for your consideration. Um, one is to understand that segregation happens through interracial negotiation. The first thing that you have to appreciate is the default position for most white supremacist governments was exclusion, not segregation. Like, you didn't get a colored-only anything. You got nothing as the usual position relative to public infrastructure and spending. And oftentimes, it took very careful management of the political and social system, oftentimes between property owners, to then get a colored-only water fountain, a colored-only waiting room, colored-only seating in the football stadium and the like. And so understanding how that process of negotiation set us down a particular path in terms of how we understand the place of violence within our politics is very important for us to look at. Secondly, that segregation is profitable. It's profitable. And that by understanding how Jim Crow was used to make money, we can again appreciate longer continuities in the relationship between racism and real estate, the relationship between violence and you know, formal mainstream politics, that the money that gets made from literally dividing up the market into a series of niches that can then be harvested for various forms of profit margin is extraordinarily important for recasting what we understand American economics and politics to be. The third point, which again, it shouldn't take too much of a lift for folks in this room, but it, it is worth kind of highlighting in, in very sharp relief, is that segregation is ongoing, that there's an evolution of the ways in which segregation, by way of its profit interests, by way of its use of violence kind of in the abstract and sometimes in very material terms, has been able to go on well after the formal signage of the Jim Crow era has come down. So rather than emphasizing a colored only this or that, to get us back into thinking about the processes of governance that erected the signs in the first place and think about how those processes are still unfolding before us. The talk will have uh, three parts along each of these three axes. So part one, negotiating segregation. <clears throat> right off the top, it's, it's important to appreciate that the Constitution was really bad on protecting people's civil rights. We didn't get voting as a positive right in the 15th Amendment. Right? If, you, if you go back and you look at the text, it's about making sure that Congress can impede one's right to vote. But the absence of voting as a positive right, the absence of civil rights being you know, articulated very strongly, even after the passage of the 14th Amendment, meant that for most people of color, you know, again, in African-descended people in particular, they depended on much more ironclad provisions in the country's legal foundation. That principally meant gun rights and property rights, right? And so across the Jim Crow South, certainly in the expanding West, you have a process whereby people look to owning property as being the bedrock of what their citizenship actually means. And so you get the erection and the emergence of a series of all black towns around the country. And these are places where people are pooling resources, building mutual aid, taking up arms to provide certain kinds of material defense, and then also using the mechanisms of capitalism to basically try to build and expand some kind of self-determination, some hedge of protection. So Mount Bayou, Mississippi, is one of these places that becomes very important for the early emergence of a black entrepreneurial class that can then have some kind of dealings with vicinity uh, white power brokers of a similar kind of professional and political orientation. Bowley, Oklahoma, another one of these all-black towns. Or Eatonville, Florida, where Jordan Hurston was from, is yet another, and another, and another. And so in understanding where these relationships emerge, you have to think about what are the most important pieces of this, which is that Southern governing classes needed black people to buy property so they could then leverage taxes on that property. In order to build roads and do drainage projects, you needed folks to pay property taxes. At the same time, however, you had to regulate where black folk could actually live in the name of orchestrating the racial peace under Jim Crow. This creates one of the most important and oftentimes overlooked contradictions in the Jim Crow system, where you had black people who could own land on which they could not actually live. Own land on which they could not live. This is a deed illustrating this dynamic from Miami, my hometown, circa 1923. And it's only meant to illustrate one fact, which is Mr. Dana A. Dorsey, 
is here in a lease agreement with a Mr. Anthony and a Mr. Bogiages. And these are Greek immigrants who are arriving in Miami in the 1920s and simply looking for a place to run their business. And Mr. Dorsey would go to his rental properties personally when he was able and knock on the door every Saturday to collect his rents. Dorsey was a self-described capitalist. I've actually seen the tax returns where he lists his occupation as such. Um, the tax returns sometimes can yield these insights, right? Um, you, all, you, all, you also have, um, you know, uh, Dorsey owning oil fields in Louisiana, real estate in Cuba, copper mines in Colorado. He, he legitimately has a diverse portfolio, and real estate is the bedrock. Now, again, just think about what it means in the context of the Jim Crow world to have a white tenant being collected by a black landlord. Right? Again, it turns the intimacies and the day-to-day -day activities of Jim Crow seemingly on its head. This creates a consistent problem in the Jim Crow world, in fact, where the regulation of black movement, while allowing the free flow of black capital, relative free flow of black capital, creates a series of tensions where you have surrounding downwardly mobile white communities when there are moments of unrest, literally attacking and pushing out and committing pogroms, effectively, against upwardly mobile black communities. Rosewood in 1923 is one example. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, perhaps an even more widely known example. And if you read the reportage on the Tulsa race riot, for instance, Walter White has a piece in The Nation magazine where he literally describes a white employee going to his black boss's place of business to try to burn it down, the black boss basically gunning him down and the mob singling him out, right? There's also letters around Tulsa that describe the process where people understood exactly who in the Greenwood District held their personal debt, their loans, who were their landlords, and going to those locations and trying to burn the physical paper copies that demonstrated their indebtedness, their tenancy. This is an age before cloud computing, okay? There's no backup copy being kept somewhere. And so most people kept evidence of their wealth in safes in their home, under their beds, in the corner bank. And so this, when the, when the Greenwood District is attacked, this is where whites are focusing much of their riotous energy. And there, there are letters that describe African Americans having their receipt books and account books burned, in addition to the fur coats and record players and, and automobiles that are being looted from the black elite. It was a mass property transfer from black to white hands in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with the physical burning of evidence of occupancy and indebtedness and tenancy, and whites who were formerly renting basically by you know, default declaring themselves owners of the property they'd occupy. The point here, of course, is to understand that violence is always on the table, always there as a potential threat to liquidate black assets. <clears throat> and so much of what the day-to-day -day goings ons were in the Jim Crow world were trying at some turn or another to keep violence at bay, to keep some kind of negotiation happening above board, but it didn't take much to cause a situation like that in Tulsa, for example, to erupt into, again, a, a really profound and dramatic turning over of black ownership and power. This taps into what is, again, a, a largely overlooked bedrock value in American politics. And this is the idea of, of white popular sovereignty. There's a really important book that I found um, deeply instructive on this, Ashraf Rushdie's American Lynching, where he talks about the development of American culture around the idea that white people are sovereign over the state. And it's only when you have a breakdown in formal government structures that you then get to enact the lynch mob as the appropriate way to then set everything back on its right footing. So white popular sovereignty is always there as a kind of back up form of effective state power, right? So if the judge decides he wants to acquit, the mob has the right to then take justice into their own hands. If you have a police department that isn't acting fast enough, the mob, oftentimes with members of law enforcement playing part, is going to then enact justice in the way that it will. And frontier justice, such as it existed even in areas outside of the Jim Crow South, was largely based on this principle. But understand that this is a racialized idea of who gets to basically be the American people, right? There, there have been no shortage of movements that have tried to tap into ideas of popular sovereignty. You think right off the top of a group like the Black Panther Party, for example, talking about power to the people, right? They were not considered to be the inheritors of any tradition of popular sovereignty. They were considered to be outsiders of this tradition. Right? Mm -hmm. Conversely, the, the riots, you know, and the kinds of lynch mobs here where people could literally 
take photos in front of hanging bodies and not be considered to be beyond the realms of the law, that was a much more consistent form of racial violence. And it's one that liberalism had to take into account as a political philosophy. In some ways, I really appreciate this image as the, the best representation of what democratic politics in the 20th century was built upon, which is trying to find a way through force of law to mitigate lynch law as the default, but doing so in a way that demanded a certain kind of weakness from African Americans, right? So Puck Magazine in the, cover, in the cover here is capturing the need of local law enforcement to basically stand between the cowering Negro and the lyncher, right? And, and in many respects, and again, I, I invite you to just reflect on where exactly African Americans have had to make their claims for state protection and how they've had to make those claims. What's the posture? What's the language? How much has armed self-defense been an acceptable part of the bundle of ways in which African Americans could respond and have the state on their side versus being forced to kind of step back and let the white lawman do the talking, so to speak, right? This is a very important feature of what then becomes local political practice and certainly national political culture around civil rights movements and the like, right? Where does nonviolent action seemingly elicit a sympathetic response from the state versus those who are advocating for something much more militant? Ida B. Wells, of course, was one of the most important theorists of the problem of lynching and, and was, was very instrumental in helping people understand the economic aspects of that particular form of political expression, right? That there were concerns primarily about economic competition between blacks and whites, that black people did not in any way, shape, or form need to be encouraged to acquire property, that they were in fact quite often looking to property as their means of again, building a future, and that whenever they built too much power or had too much self-determination, that lynch law would oftentimes be brought in and concerns about male sexual impropriety would be used as a kind of cover for really, again, forcibly transferring property from black to white hands. At the same time, there's a growing sense that this problem of white popular sovereignty means that you have to institutionalize certain forms of white supremacy. So there's arguments about the economics behind the lynch law, but then there's also this need to basically make the Ku Klux Klan, for example, a civic organization that can run candidates for office. And you look at urban politics through the 1920s, you see Klan chapters openly running candidates in Detroit, in Chicago, in South Florida, in Atlanta, and elsewhere. I mean, this was, again, a dual problem of figuring out how do you get people to participate in the market on the one hand, while still recognizing a certain kind of white regulation of black economic futures as an acceptable piece of American political practice, right? So what does this look like kind of on the ground, right? How do these negotiations happen? Again, so much of this is about helping you appreciate the early period of the Jim Crow um, world as one of negotiation. So this is uh, Haswa Hachi, or a man whose anglicized name is Tony Tommy. Now, he was, um, by every possible measure, a master showman of the 19 teens and 20s. He actually worked with D.W. Griffith in providing uh, indigenous actors for Griffith films during the early motion picture industry, which was actually based in Hollywood, Florida, before there was Hollywood, California. Um, the hurricane of 1926 actually is what changed uh, California to the motion picture epicenter. Um, but, but Tommy was somebody who knew exactly how to tug on the expectations of whites politically and, and the symbolic assumptions that they had about the timeless kind of Native American. He also was, you know, trying as best he could to get public sector investments in indigenous life because there were public health crises, there were education crises, there were housing crises that were afflicting indigenous people in the hinterlands around Miami. So again, some of you may remember this story if you've read A World More Concrete. Um, I tend to like it as just a, a, a way of, in some ways, capturing the closing of the indigenous world and the opening of, of the Jim Crow world in more, more formal terms. Now, this is a, a shot from the forward to the soil event of 1927. And j just to be very quick about what basically happens here, Tony Tommy works with members of the Miami Chamber of Commerce, and they do a kind of surrender ceremony out in the bush. He finds uh, a headdress from a local Indian collector, um, a peace pipe, he invents a flag for the occasion just so he can surrender it. Um, and, and during the course of the afternoon, he proceeds to initiate a ceremony wherein Native American women, uh, excuse me, Native American men dig holes in the ground with wooden implements. Behind those men are Native American women who plant seed into those holes. 
Behind those women are rows of tractors made of rubber and steel that tear up all the earth that had just been planted. And behind those tractors are 13 white women, all wearing sashes reflecting the 13 colonies and dressed like farmers, who then proceed to plant seed in the new soil behind. And, and over this entire affair, Hathwahachi is speaking in native Miccosukee, even though he speaks fluent English. And he's saying that the red man is a child of destiny. The white man is a child, excuse me, the red man is a child of nature. The white man is a child of destiny. It is time for the child of nature to surrender to the child of destiny. And he proceeds to pull out the peace pipe, to take a couple puffs with the Miami Chamber of Commerce head. He then proceeds to take his headdress and lift it off his head and put it on the top of the chamber his new chief, and declared mastery over 110,000 acres of Native American land. Now, if any of you are familiar with South Florida's geography, this land ends up basically being Miami Lakes, Hialeah, and, and a series of very affluent, um, you know, suburban communities. Um, the, the land itself passes to a man by the name of Ernest Graham. Um, Ernest uh, opens a dairy farm, and he's working on behalf of a local sugar corporation. He has three sons. One is named William Robert and Philip, there are three. Uh, Philip basically uses the family connections and the wealth generated by this land to work his way into becoming the editor-in-chief of the Washington Post, Phil Graham. Mm -hmm. William Graham uses this land to become a very affluent real estate developer, selling off lots in Miami Lakes. Um, and young Robert, who showed a talent for reading and books, goes on to Harvard and becomes a lawyer and subsequently senator. Bob Graham and Governor Bob Graham of Florida. All of this begun from this early illegal, illegal land transaction. Uh, Tony Tommy himself, out of this negotiation, didn't get anything. Um, he actually, within 30 days, was dead from tuberculosis. He and his wife were the only people to uh, get or contract tuberculosis, apparently. Um, as a final point of this, there were no chief. There were no chiefs of the Seminoles. They, he totally just behaved in this way. There were a council of elders. And when they heard about the land transaction, needless to say, they were very upset about the whole thing. So Tony Tommy went to his death feeling as if the uh, doctors of the tribe put bad medicine on him, so to speak. Um, now, uh, the, the kind of transactions here um, under Tony Tommy are only slightly different from what becomes a certain kind of colonial negotiation, right? And, and it's really important to understand that the principles of indirect rule are operating constantly in the United States. And this is, you know, just to echo a point that was raised in the opening remarks by Matt, I'm, I'm really keen on helping people get out of <clears throat> a framework that thinks about American democracy and policy and liberalism as just a march toward citizenship and instead thinking about the mechanisms of government that create the need for this middling governing class of subaltern people to basically broker with a white elite. So President Roosevelt's Federal Council on Negro Affairs, the black cabinet, becomes this really important way of introducing black people to certain forms of federal power, especially after the mass demotion of African Americans under President Woodrow Wilson in 1913. But even with the anointing of the so-called black cabinet, there was a sense that they were operating as these kind of brokers. And there's one gentleman, George Streeter, a kind of labor activist and journalist who's writing Du Bois in the mid-1930s, and he's very concerned, you know, will not all these black bureaucrats behave precisely as Britain's Nigerian chiefs and priests, right? That, that there's a real sense, even among you know, commentators at the time, that colonialism and American democracy are actually more alike than they are different. Now, it's certainly important to recognize that these black brokers were, were very critical for building access to certain kinds of federal monies. So having you know, funds for black farmers or creating opportunities for black housing projects, all of this was part of the broader set of negotiations that were only possible in the context of building jointly a white and colored world. This brings us to part two of the, project, of the talk today, um, which is to discuss segregation's profitability. It's in creating these kind of dual systems that we found ways to basically rebuild the American economy, you know, through the Great Depression and certainly took our cues from an earlier period of segregating the marketplace. Um, this is a tip to my, my friend Robert here, the, the Oakland HOLC security map, right? Just so you can see redlining um, kind of on full display. You know, you have a, a, a grading system. Again, most of you in the room will probably have some familiarity with this. Some of my, my colleagues in the early modern and modern period might not know it as well. But, um, you know, it's, it's important to just to understand that the officials in the housing sector in Washington and certainly at local 
um, housing offices around the country, believed that it was necessary to divide the country up into a series of racial niche markets, that you were only going to sustain economic growth by giving people certain assurances that you weren't going to have unnatural or unnecessary interracial mixing. Now, it's, of course, a feature of slavery where proximity was necessary for the working of your average plantation. It was also true in most southern cities that whites depended very heavily on an intimate connection to African Americans and black labor, even going down to the you know, constant um, contact between you know, black mammies and their white children charges, right? nursing them even. Right? We know these kind of stories. But somehow, separation became necessary through the teens, 20s, and certainly then in the 30s when it got institutionalized into a kind of national Jim Crow policy. I'll, I'll skip ahead just in the interest of time to, to get out of the weeds, but you know, just know that there are basically four grading systems, and each of those are being used to determine who's going to get certain kinds of support. Now, government support. Now, one of the things, things that I think is really important to keep in mind around this is basically a twofold thing. Number one, that the redlining practice was justified as a way to ensure racial peace. And the notion that people were only going to live in areas where there were no African Americans was another way in which white popular sovereignty was institutionalized. So I want to just be very clear about what's going on in the redlining system. Number one, you have a set of white values that are being banked by the federal government and obviously by the financial sector extending credit. But that also, and this is really important, it's not simply a story about people getting access to credit and then buying homes that then accumulate equity in the future. The redlining system was actually created to determine who was going to get a bailout during the Depression itself. In other words, African Americans in black neighborhoods were not seen as being suitable for bailouts from the federal government. People's property was instead mass transferred from, again, black to white hands by virtue of the federal government's agency in this, in this process. So, it surprises some people to learn that the high watermark for black ownership in America was 1920. Black ownership has never approached 1920 numbers, in part because of what happened as you move from the post-Reconstruction era politics of ownership through the Depression without any federal support. You again, you again have a, a move of money, resources, and physical land into white hands. This is an image of Baltimore, um, where I currently live, where, again, you see these red areas here and then affluent areas in the green and blue in the outs, right? And so people began to make it um, almost easy to feast upon these neighborhoods of downwardly mobile African Americans and to really deny them access um, to ownership. Now, without ownership as a viable option for most people, again, certain forms of violence, certain forms of um, hardship and exploitation become uniquely borne by black communities. This is just an example of some of the housing that existed in these Jim Crow era redlined black communities, wooden construction, oftentimes extraordinarily dangerous, um, no indoor plumbing, no paving, oftentimes in the South, certainly no mosquito screens. Um, anybody here ever been to Disney World? One, two, three. I know, I, a question came out of nowhere, I know, but I, I just, <laughs> I, you'll, you'll see my point in a minute, right? And anybody here ever taken a, taken a kid to Disney World? Okay, one or two, three, yeah. So if you've ever been to Disney World or taken a kid to Disney World, you've either given or gotten the speech, okay? And, and the speech goes something like this. Don't touch anything, don't ask for anything, I'm not buying you anything, <laughs> <laughs> nothing here is for you, right? And you, you give the speech or you get the speech because it's known that once you go through those gates at Disney World, everything is going to be much more expensive, right? You know, b back in the day when I used, used to buy, like, film for the camera, you guys remember film, right? Like, film was, like, four times the price of film at, like, the local drugstore, right, when you went inside Epcot or, or Disney World, right? That's the same reason why nobody here really goes grocery shopping or clothes shopping at the airport, even though there are, like, <laughs> offerings there, right? You can go to a Brooks Brothers, that's kind of like an annex that's behind the gate. But, you know, like, things are going to be very expensive once you walk through those airport gates. And, oh, by the way, the selection's not going to be that great either. You can only have so many shirts with, like, Providence across the front, right? Um, living in the Jim Crow real estate world, the Jim Crow South, but even parts North, was like living in Disney World without the rides, right? Everything costs more because of the confinement, because of the gates and the walls, both real and invisible. You paid more for health care. You paid more for food. You paid more for durable goods. You certainly paid more for housing. This kind of property would oftentimes cost more, not just more than white 
occupied property of similar quality, but certainly white properties of better quality. In fact, some of the properties pictured here cost more than a hotel room in Miami during the exact same period. In 1949, you could get a hotel waterfront in Miami for $17.50 a week. This particular slum property here would run as much as $18 a week just to live in it. And you have to share it with seven or eight people because of black underemployment just to make that rent. And oh, by the way, every Saturday, the rent collector would show up looking for his rent at five and six in the morning. And it was every Saturday because the mythology around black people in the Jim Crow era was they weren't disciplined enough economically to save their money for monthly rental payments. So they had to be weekly rental payments and the like, right? So this was just one of the many kind of nested indignities of living and residing in the Jim Crow period. It's also one of the reasons why for many of the black elite, they believe that by brokering for a public option, like public housing, you could somehow make it easier to survive some of the har hardships in the Jim Crow period. So things like the Liberty Square housing project in South Florida were seen as being a necessary bomb against certain forms of predatory practice. Um, it's also, as a side note, again, one of these sites of negotiation where we're going to have segregation for housing on a covered only whites only basis, and then we'll let you have a black administrator to run the housing project or have a black you know, commissioner be in charge of uh, selecting those who are going to be involved in the housing project. Again, a site of negotiation on a Jim Crow basis. At the same time, the culture of Jim Crow was that really of slavery and its afterlife. And so films like Gone with the Wind and you know, the iconography of the faithful slave, all of this was concurrent with the emergence of this colored only, whites only world being subsidized by the federal government. So again, portrayals of black loyalty and paternalism were part and parcel of the kinds of negotiations that were happening at the level of the politics in this period. The folks who were pushing against some of these mechanisms were ironically white landlords themselves. So you know, I, I write a fair amount um, about white landlords and how they complicate the history of segregation. This is an example of we want white tenants in our white community. It's basically a concern about blockbusting white landlords being able to push the color line and let black people in because, frankly, without the options to have effective housing or you know, appropriate housing, you had condensations of black renters just expanding and ballooning in black neighborhoods and oftentimes vacancies in white parts of the rental economy. And so they were always trying to tether some kind of profit making to bringing black people into the white housing projects with you know, the natural responses being oftentimes white violence. This is just an example of the way in which entire regions were built around the indispensability of black labor. So here is Miami's Central Negro District and it's located centrally between Miami Beach between the golf course here and the, the other leisure destinations that tourists were tapping into, the Orange Bowl where one saw games, the affluent neighborhoods of Coral Gables, and eventually the airport here. And so you needed to have close proximity of the black working class to service this leisure destination. Right? But at the same time, the housing quality being what it was, it created negative press when there were fires, when there were crimes, when there were outbreaks of tuberculosis. And so many planners tried to use their ability to rewrite the landscape with expanding powers of land regulation, especially in the post-war period, to try to unmake some of these black neighborhoods and really cast people out to the fringes. And so there's a conflict that emerges between those who are looking to use ever professional means of urban development against those who are making their money from this poverty. And this is the, a, a very important tension that oftentimes gets overlooked is that some of the most principal conflicts of the Jim Crow world were not between whites and blacks in, in, a, in a general sense, but actually between people who were defending black property rights and profiteering on the one hand, and those who wanted to basically displace black people and also use displacement as a means of race reform. So you have two different approaches to what to do with the fundamental problem of property, property ownership, and the kinds of money that segregation is making. Okay. The general story of suburbanization, levitowns, towns, consumer spaces, new appliances, and that is definitely happening around this time. And African Americans are trying to access this in, in ways that they would hope to. But obviously, most suburbanization was, by and large, kept out of black hands. 
you had, in some cases, too, the, the forcible uh, expulsion of black people from the orbits of these expanding suburbs. So this particular episode in Miami in 1947 is one in which, in fact, you have a, an area of white homeowners who's displacing black suburbanites in the name of building a whites-only school, a whites-only firehouse, a whites-only uh, green space. And they're using the public provisions of eminent domain law to say, we have the right to do this, and basically cast black residents, in this case about 100 families, to the far reaches of Broward County and Dade County. Um, in some cases, you had people's homes physically put on the back of flatbed trucks and moved 15 miles away, placed in the dirt, only to have them a month later knocked down by the hurricane of 1947, right? So this is, again, in climate gentrification, environmental injustice, circa, you know, post-war U.S., in light of these kinds of violences, right, in, in light of more professionalized, modernized pogroms, right, Tulsa displacement now on steroids and sterilized through eminent domain, you create another kind of site of negotiation, in which case many of the slum profiteering landlords were also involved in the very early nascent black suburbanization movement of the post-war period, opening up housing for black folk and sometimes doing it on terms that were not the most generous. So buying homes on contract, you know, having certain kinds of, you know, debt instruments that were still profiteering f from black aspirations at upward mobility. This becomes a critical element in the expansion of the post-war growth in suburban and metropolitan America. Lake Meadows in Chicago, Pontchartrain Park in New Orleans. This is an image here of Richmond Heights in South Florida. Richmond Heights in particular was built 15 miles south of the black downtown. Only a single bus route took people from Richmond Heights into the downtown area or onto their places of employment. It was considered to be so far as to be behind God's back, was the language of the day. Um, but it was also a place that gave many black people for the first time green spaces and, again, places to kind of act on their own suburban dreams. Again, all of this is being negotiated on a strictly Jim Crow basis, okay? And the argument being that it's much more peaceful to separate the races. And many African Americans believing too that this is gonna be a place where we can safely be ourselves and achieve a, medal of, a measure of middle class existence. This is one of those suburban homes in a neighborhood called Brownsville in Liberty City, just beyond what at that time was the municipal boundaries of the city of Miami. And this is, you know, Billie Holiday with a group of local teachers really, you know, showing and exhibiting a certain kind of affluence in the post-war period that was, you know, considered to be a real achievement for many African Americans. I also love this image very quickly because it captures kind of the asymmetries of power um, that existed even in black America on a segregated side, which is, you know, Billie Holiday here in the lovely taffeta dress and staring at the camera. All the gaze is kind of fixated on her as a celebrity. And then the, the somewhat nameless worker here basically manning the operation as, you know, the help. The, the landlords and entrepreneurs who are investing and expanding um, black consumer and leisure options are building um, the Hampton House Motel and Villa. That was a white-owned development that was actually um, occupied by Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke the night that Ali won the championship um, in 1964. Um, you have the Orange Blossom Classic negotiated by landlords in the area to allow black people to play college football in the Orange Bowl. The Mary Elizabeth Hotel here, owned by an African-American doctor and his family, who built the finest kind of concrete hotel in the South, but also owned about 300 rental properties that were not kept above code by any stretch. Um, into this world, you have, again, more brokers. And, and this is where I think it's, again, important to just kind of bear down a little bit, which is to understand these people who are lubricating the workings of Jim Crow's profitability. Luther Brooks um, is a Georgian who migrates down to Miami during the Great Depression and basically sets up a, an infrastructure of property management where landlords who live in New England, who live in the Midwest, can basically acquire properties they've never even seen to have their rents collected, to have the properties managed, to have the taxes paid. And Luther Brooks just gets 8% of whatever comes back from the property itself. He actually managed 14,000 units at one time. Half of all black people in Miami lived in a property managed by Luther Brooks. And he used the money that he generated to basically put 
some black kids through medical school, to run black debutante balls, to support black businesses, black newspaper outfits, and he was considered by many to be impossible to root out because he also paid off state senators and worked to keep landlord and tenant regulations quite weak so that profit margins could remain high. So he worked both sides of the operation. And oh, by the way, as a subcontractor, he owned not a piece of rental property in the entire state. He simply was there to manage the unit. So you can never get him on any of the conditions that actually generated the profits for the landlord. He would simply say, you have to talk to Mr. So-and-so. He may live somewhere in Medford, Massachusetts. I can't seem to get a hold of him. And that would be basically the end of it, right, as the fire basically broke out and, you know, in the tenements. Um, this is just very quickly um, Brooks kind of shaking hands with Jake Gaither, who was the head coach of the Florida A&M football team, by most accounts the most important black football coach in the country at the time. Um, here he is giving a check to a local black nursery. Um, again, the philanthropy of Luther Brooks was quite legendary. Here's a Christmas dinner that was given to each of the tenants of one of Brooks's clients, Mr. Abe Schoenfeld. Again, Schoenfeld being Jewish, still was smart enough to recognize that the Christmas season was one in which you had to generate a certain kind of loyalty by giving chickens, cranberry sauce, cake, peas, corn, and so and so, like a veritable you know, bounty there, even as he profited from, again, the horrible conditions in the, the tenements. So the paternalism and these negotiations were part of what, again, kept the lubricated economy of the Jim Crow world moving. At the same time, certain aspects of white popular sovereignty were slowly being regulated after the challenges of World War II, the moral challenges of World War II were taking shape. So the Klan, you know, basically gets moved against by a series of Jewish um, local politicians who worked their way into like that first generation of, of mainstream Jewish politicians in the South in the 1940s and 50s, African-American allies as well, certain moderate whites, and they begin to do things like prevent the Klan from wearing hoods, prevent the Klan from burning crosses. All this is about trying to get rid of some of the most overt markers of hatred. Um, there still were ways in which people were trying to keep the color lines preserved, and they were doing so with like letter writing campaigns to governors and saying things like, as a property owner in Miami, Will you please help us in our fight to protect our homes from infiltration of the colored race? Right? This is a, a somewhat more genteel form of discrimination. Um, Anna Northcroft, 751 Northwest 63rd Street. Sometimes you got the old language as well. Don't want nigger neighbors in Edison Center. Let's get them out or else riot, signed. Mr. and Mrs. Fred Coleman, 1052 Northwest 65th Street. These were formerly white neighborhoods. They're not black neighborhoods in South Florida. Now, by the 1950s, um, the violence that was emerging um, was only one piece of what was, again, the broader problem of the Jim Crow world. There were absolutely economic pressures. There were concerns about racial terrorism. Um, but for the most part, people found ways to modernize the economy and keep things moving. You got to the point where you could keep a certain kind of segregation in place without having to resort to the same kinds of language. So this is one of my more favorite images where you could use this, the old world language, but you had to cover your face when the cameraman came around. Um, I only, only put this image up for one reason, which is to, to try to help people un appreciate the fact that the Jim Crow world was not that long ago. Color photos do it in a way that black and white photos simply cannot, right? Collapsing that distance between our time and their time. Um, one more here. Again, this, these are all in, in, in critical to, to articulate very important sites of negotiation. In fact, as, as a quick aside before we move to the last section here, you know, most of the times when you had people who were negotiating for colored only this or that, they did so with physical tax receipts showing that they had paid for their infrastructure through their property taxes. And so you needed to have a colored only fountain, a colored only theater house and the like, because they basically helped to subsidize. And that argument wound up being quite effective, even when you had white supremacist governments. Very quickly, last section, Jim Crow's afterlife. So through the 1960s and 70s, you have a, a, a somewhat sanitizing, I guess you could describe it, of the way that we came to talk about difference and the way in which the uses of real estate again, help to streamline the workings of segregation. This is the important relationship here. What work did real estate do in changing how we talked about it and how we, you know, how we talked about segregation while preserving how segregation, in fact, worked monetarily? Okay, this is, this is the point. What's the relationship between segregation and real estate and its workings? This is Carl Stokes just talking, and he's already out of the mayor's office in 1972. 
America no longer talks about spips, spicks and wops and niggers, but rather talks about density and overcrowding of schools, et cetera, to achieve the same purpose. Stokes was part of a black political class that arrived in power in the late 60s and was trying to use, the, again, expanding powers of land management to try to unmake some of the concentrations of poverty and profiteering that were afflicting black America. Urban renewal was seen as being part of this desegregation approach, part of this sanitizing and redrawing of the color lines approach. Urban renewal project to encourage integration, read one headline in the Miami Times. This is the Central Negro District from 1948. Many of you know how this story ends. Some 50,000 residents of the black downtown, again, churning out rents to a profound degree for the more affluent uh, landlords of the country, not just of the region. It becomes subject to a massive highway interchange going into that community um, through the 1960s, right? And, you know, it's important to keep in mind that many of the folks who left that area, even who were African-American, basically entered suburban communities and tried to continue to hold on to their rental properties in the black downtown in the meantime. However, because of the politics of relocation housing, many of the displaced were basically forced through, again, further segregated housing location right back into black neighborhoods, in this case, in Liberty City. And there was a riot that emerged in 1968, partially stoked by the Republican National Convention happening in Miami at the time, but also marked by the ways in which landlords were already finding ways to carve up the old suburban promised lands into now very concentrated sites of suburban poverty. As a quick aside on this, Black ownership in Miami's downtown was about 30%. They owned about 30% of the housing there. Whites owned 70% of the real estate in the black downtown. In the first generation after formal desegregation in Liberty City, whites owned 90% of the housing. White percentages of ownership actually went up because of liquidation of black assets and their ability to basically manage white flight to the point where whites would maybe move, but they wouldn't let go of the property that a black family would then turn around and occupy. So you're finding ways of making money still in the Jim Crow way, sometimes better, but without that signage, without that narrative of white supremacy kind of selling the operations. In the meantime, of course, then you still have the same kinds of relationships between a kind of managerial class of blacks and whites, this time in 1969, negotiating the arrival of a very important new development, the Underexpressway Park, right? So after the neighborhood was bulldozed, the uh, city commissioner at the time, Ms. M. Athelie Range, helps to negotiate having a playground built underneath the expressway as a token of good faith in the wake of the riots in Liberty City the year before. It's a moment of interracial congratulations and a sense that there's a really affluent Sunbelt era to come. The newspapers, the Black uh, Miami Times, said this was a great idea. This is actually how they talked about this um, establishment. And one of the things I, I love about this is on the very page where the park is talked about in such glowing terms, you have a quarter page ad from Luther Brooks, whose bonded rental agency is, is finding yet another way to continue to collect rents. And now he's moved his offices as well out of the black downtown. Um, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. You know, if I am to enjoy a better life, others must live better too, right? The messaging of paternalism continuing. Um, you know, that, as, a, as a closing point here, you know, just know that you know, many whites also basically built their own arguments about rights and land from certain templates borrowed from the black freedom struggle. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip ahead the Atwater quote. Some of you know this, but I know we're, we're kind of wrapping up. Um, basically, Atwater just says you can't say you know, nigger anymore. Um, <laughs> that's basically what he says. Um, and, 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 and the last thing I'll say about this, the, well, two last points. The first, yeah, this is actually important, two last points. The first is that property value and real estate prices are still set in this country as they were set in the 1930s in direct relation to the concentrations of black communities, by and large. And so this is merely a shot of the Greenmount Corridor in Baltimore, where you have you know, pro housing projects and private homes valued around $100,000, sometimes less, a small barrier, and then just opposite that barrier, homes in the Guilford community, that the further you get from that road, housing values go up by as much as $400,000, right? There's a direct relationship between one's ability to see the Greenmount Corridor and one's housing price, right? The second thing is, and this is where it really does kind of flash to the present, 
is that when you have a seeming breakdown of American institutions, when the state doesn't do what it's supposed to do, you still, we're still living in a moment where you see the mechanisms, the, the means, iconography of white popular sovereignty rearing their head. You may remember this from the health care debate when the Republicans in Congress simply said and asserted the American people don't want health care, the American people don't want this and that. It was a racialized notion of America, make America great again, and the like. The presidency in particular was one of the great institutions that kind of facilitated a, a certain Jim Crow principle insofar as it was a whites-only institution up until 2008. This particular image, the Shepard Ferry shot of Obama, becomes iconic um, and, you know, helps to capture this possible, you know, change in the system. And yet it was used in the 2012 campaign as yet another expression of the old lynch law. This was actually a meme that was found on the servers of Republican campaign strategists during the election, re-election campaign um, of Obama in 2012. And again, you don't get this imagery if the presidency does what it's always done, which is remain a whites-only institution. It's only with the breakdown that the reassertion of lynch law becomes unnecessary. And again, this is one of those things that most people don't really have the wherewithal to see and understand that when whites-only institutions seemingly don't work in the eyes of whites, you then get the kinds of mob actions, you then get the kinds of white populism that we're now seeing in places like Charlottesville and certainly out of our own White House. So um, I thank you all very much for your attention, um, and I look forward to your questions.